first, I, I would like to thank Amcha Germany um, and uh, the organizers of, of this seminar for uh, inviting me for the opportunity to talk about um, this subject, uh, which is very close to my heart. Um, I, I began studying the long-term effects of, of the Holocaust early on uh, during my PhD study. Uh, and I was especially fascinated by the phenomenon of trauma transmission. I therefore extended my research to family members of Holocaust survivors, their children and grandchildren. And in recent years, I also began studying massive trauma and the transmission of trauma in other traumatized groups around the world. So in, in this talk, I will discuss the effects of the Holocaust across generations. Uh, in survivor families. Uh, the first part of my talk, I will include a brief overview of the evidence regarding the effects of the Holocaust in descendants of survivors. Uh, I will try to show uh, that although most survivors and descendants exhibit relatively normal functioning, we can see vulnerability that may appear in certain families due to various factors and under specific situations. In the second part of my talk, I will review several directions in which future research develops, uh, mainly late life issues uh, in the first generation and the second generation, uh, the search for potential biomarkers, of Holocaust effects and uh, also um, the increased focus on grandchildren of uh, survivors. So I would like to begin by referring broadly to the intergenerational transmission of trauma. Uh, this transmission <clears throat> encompasses the effects of ancestral trauma on the bio psychosocial functioning of the next generations were not directly exposed to the focal trauma. So the phenomenon of trauma transmission was documented following various adversities. Um, we have evidence uh, showing the effects of parental trauma on subsequent generations uh, coming from uh, war veterans, uh, prisoners of war, uh, survivors of the Cambodian genocide, the Armenian genocide, and many other events of massive trauma. So this is one example that I brought you here. Um, a research uh, of mine and my colleagues in which we followed uh, the possible transmission of trauma across three generations following the 2011 um, uh, Fukushima disaster in Japan. So in this specific um, event, more than 15,000 people were killed by the earthquake and the following tsunami, and the aftermath of the disaster was a nuclear meltdown in Fukushima. So in the case of Japan, uh, the nuclear disaster has awakened the memories of uh, the World War II atomic bombs. And my colleagues and I collected data from two groups of Japanese, uh, grandchildren of people who were in the greater Hiroshima and Nagasaki wow. during the war, and a comparison group, uh, grandchildren whose ancestors were living elsewhere in Japan during the war. So relative to comparisons, grandchildren of Japanese living in Hiroshima and Nagasaki showed higher level of post-traumatic distress and greater fear of radiation exposure. So these findings may indicate the possibility that uh, subsequent generations may show higher psychological sensitivity to adversity, which activates associations related to ancestral trauma. And another example of transmission comes from Rwanda. Uh, there between uh, several months <clears throat> in uh, 1994, Hutu militia murdered Tutsi victims with machats and rifles. And uh, the estimations are talking about um, approximately 1 million people who were killed, about 70% of the Tutsi population. Uh, and together with my colleagues, uh, we investigated survivors of the Tutsi genocide and their offspring who were born after the genocide. 
And we focused on complex PTSD, which is a relatively new diagnosis that includes additional symptoms to regular PTSD symptoms. And we found that offspring whose parents suffered from complex PTSD reported higher psychological distress and lower resilience uh, compared to other groups of offspring, those who had parents with PTSD or those who had parents without uh, uh, severe symptoms. So although the phenomenon of transmission of trauma is studied worldwide, most of the evidence comes from Holocaust survivors and their families. And this memorial uh, shoes on the, the Nuba Bank can serve as an image for intergenerational transmission. This memorial is located in Budapest and honors the Jews who were killed by fascist arrow cross men during the war. Uh, the victims were ordered to take off their shoes and were shot at the edge of the water uh, so that their bodies fell into the river. And some of the victims were tied to each other so that when the first person was shot, the rest fell with him and drowned in the river. So in trying to understand the phenomenon of transmission, we mainly ask whether generations are unavoidably tied to each other, or is it possible for following generations to disentangle themselves from the negative after effects of uh, trauma? So the effects of Holocaust on subsequent generations are well depicted in many works of literature, uh, the visual arts and music. And this book by uh, David Grossman uh, called See Under Love is one of the most famous examples. In this book, uh, we meet Momik, a young boy, a second generation for Holocaust survivors. And no matter how hard he tries, his parents remain hunted by the horrors of the war. And no one tells Momik exactly what happened during the war. And Momik vows to free his parents somehow from their fears. And he becomes a cold and a bitter man, obsessed with death and afraid to love. And uh, he tells his wife, it's dangerous to become attached to anyone uh, because you can lose. Uh, that person. And eventually, uh, he begins writing a series of stories, and through them, uh, he will take a small step toward redemption, uh, toward becoming a new man. And another uh, example comes from this uh, book by Michel Kishka. Um, and only when uh, he was 50 years old, he learned his own family history. His father, Henry Kishka, survived Auschwitz, but never told his children his story. And years later, after the suicide of Michel's brother, the father finally opened and began talking about what happened to him. And faced with his family story, Kishka produced this autobiographical graphic novel called Second Generation, The Things I Didn't Tell My Father, and in this novel, he describes his ambivalent feelings towards his father and, and the subject of the Holocaust. And you can see in these pictures, the young Michel receiving a letter from his father asking him to join him to his visit in Auschwitz. And we can see how he complains that he already had an, an overdose of, of the Holocaust, so-called. Uh, and this scene depicts what many offspring probably felt at one time or another, that they had enough. And they do not want to continue thinking and dwelling about the past of their parents. Uh, a third example comes from the well-known album of Yuda Poliker, an Israeli singer. Uh, Poliker's parents were Holocaust survivors from Greece. And uh, he wrote and produced this album, Ashes and Dust. Um, and the album, I think, was the first one um, that dealt almost exclusively with the effects of the Holocaust, um, focusing on, on the second generation. And I brought the lyrics of one of the songs titled Because, 
I think this song depicts quite vividly the experience of being a second generation. So notice the words, uh, because after that war, I was born because of fear of being deserted, because love always has to end, because every bedroom looks like an anteroom, because every house looks like the last stop, because the suitcase waiting for a move, because of the memory of a sudden departure, because you always have to run, because of the alienating kiss of mother, because of the threatening finger of father, because you mustn't forget and there's nowhere to escape. We too are victims. So notice the words, he's talking about the second generation. So the song, emphasize that the suffering of the second generation victims uh, is less heard because of the necessity to accommodate themselves to the needs of their traumatized parents. So I'll get back to this point later on. So moving from works of art to professional literature, we can see that clinicians and researchers began to look at the transmission of the Holocaust as early as 20 years after the end of the war. So this specific paper, I think it's the first one ever published on the subject, uh, was published uh, in 1965 uh, by a Canadian uh, Jewish psychiatrist called Vivian Rekhoff. And he received uh, patients in his clinic in Canada. And he describes in this paper the symptoms that he uh, saw in these second generation patients who came to his clinic. So he says, within the last year or two, it has been my experience similar to that of other psychiatrists that I'm seeing more adolescents than one would expect whose parents are, are survivors of the Holocaust. These children, all of whom were born after the Holocaust, display severe psychiatric symptomatology, it would almost be easier to believe that they, rather than their parents, had suffered the corrupting, searing hell. So since this paper, hundreds of papers and books and chapters were written on the intergenerational transmission of the Holocaust. So I will try to give a brief overview of the literature uh, I depicted the, the literature according to the chronological order. So following, uh, following Rakoff uh, paper from 1965, there were additional papers in the 70s where clinicians expressed alarm over the high number of survivor children seeking psychotherapy for severe symptoms. So the emphasis was on psychopathology. Um, however, the conclusions were based on clinical and anecdotal accounts, and there was little data about the real prevalence of psychopathology among survivor children, and the actual number of children who sought or needed psychotherapy. And no one was discussing adaptive mechanisms, um, so it, it looks like the authors mostly wanted to alert others about the possibility of, of transmission of trauma. And during the 80s, the focus shifted from severe psychopathology to other variables. So parental child rearing behaviors, uh, intrafamilial patterns of communication. And some scholars noted that many survivors seem to be able to carry out the roles as parents and some noted that different types of survivors, for example, El Daniele talked about it, uh, a typology of uh, survival families, and different types of survivors should be acknowledged. Uh, still, most studies were based on non-random biased samples. And in the 90s, we see the first large-scale random epidemiological studies uh, and these studies generally did not find evidence of higher rates of psychiatric disorders in the second generation. 
However, at the same time, the research group of Rachel Yehuda in New York showed a link between parental PTSD and higher rates of PTSD in the second generation. So at the end of the 90s and during the first decade of, of the new millennia, uh, there were mainly integrative publications uh, trying to review the whole of the literature. Uh, for example, Daniele published her 1998 book about transmission. Uh, Nathan Kellerman published his uh, review of the literature. Um, there were two meta-analytical studies by Sagi Schwartz and colleagues about the second generation, the third generation. And the UDA group in New York provided neurobiological evidence or for dysregulation in bodily stress response in the second generation. And in the last decade or so, uh, survivors enter the last phase of their lives and uh, the second generation reaches uh, midlife. So research focused more and more on the physical health and aging uh, of these uh, groups. And the UDA group in the States presented initial evidence for epigenetic processes working in the first and the second generation. And also, um, the, uh, there was increased uh, focus and interest in the third generation. So in light of the mixed evidence uh, in the literature, transmission of the Holocaust became a phenomenon in dispute, basically. So there was, uh, for example, this study by Sagi Schwartz, um, who did not find any signs of increased distress in the second and third generation of the Holocaust. But there was the second uh, study by Rachel Yehuda presented clear evidence for higher mental distress in second generation individuals. And there was the 2000, 2003 a meta-analytic study by Van Isendorn. Um, they covered more than 30 samples comparing second generation offspring to um, uh, comparison groups. And they did not find any difference between the groups. Uh, and they concluded that um, uh, the second generation um, uh, manifest the same mental and social functioning as their counterparts. Uh, who did not have Holocaust survivor parents. Uh, however, a recent meta-analytic study published in 2020 uh, found higher PTSD and secondary traumatization in the second generation, but not in the third generation, the grandchildren of uh, survivors. So some writers revisited the theory of trauma transmission and raised doubts about the validity of this theory. For example, this um, paper by Robin Gomelin, an American psychoanalyst, um, she reviewed uh, more than 50 cases, uh, descriptions of second generation in her paper, and look what she concludes. I likened the creation of the theory about the Holocaust survivors' children to the construction of a monument within the, that monument that anxieties, projections, and theoretical and political ideologies, as well as the unconscious experiences of theorists are contained. And in another example, Knobler, um, he's an Israeli psychiatrist and his colleagues uh, published this paper in 2015 titled Myth and Reality. And they note it is necessary to continue learning from Holocaust survivors who are living among us, and of course, to see to their well being. Therefore, the focus on future generations might deflect attention from the real heroes, the Holocaust survivors. So, is it possible that the theory of Holocaust transmission is largely the result of? the ideologies and experiences of scholars? Uh, should we discard the concept of future generations altogether, like some authors suggest? I think, and also um, 
some of uh, the other authors in the field, my colleagues, uh, Yael Danieli, Nathan Kellerman, uh, we suggest that there is plenty of evidence to conclude that the theory of transmission is valid and worth investigating. However, the field should change its focus. We need to move from asking whether offspring of survivors as a whole are more vulnerable to questions regarding specific families, specific conditions, specific mechanisms that are associated with trauma transmission. And this position is built on the assumption that transmission is not inevitable consequence of the parent's traumatic trauma. It is rather an outcome of various many other factors. For example, and this list is not exhaustive, but it, it depicts several factors that I propose as potential regulators of transmission of trauma. For example, um, scholars propose that transmission is dependent upon the gender of parents, the gender of children. So the effects should be stronger among daughters compared to sons. Or maybe when we look at transmission from the mother to the daughter, um, uh, instead of from the father to the son. Um, others refer to the child time of birth, the number of children in the family, the number of parents who were exposed to the Holocaust, suggesting that uh, transmission was more salient when children were born shortly after the war ended in the late 40s, beginning of the 50s, uh, in one child families or in families with two survivor parents. It was suggested that uh, in these families, children absorbed much more parental distress than in other cases. Um, we should also consider the specific dynamics between the parent and child. In some families, parents uh, discourage the child uh, to gradually separate from them. And the child learned that he needs or she needs to stay close to the parents. And later on, the child developed a stronger inner desire to heal the parents from the traumatic wounds so that one day the child himself can be free and achieve autonomy. Uh, moreover, it is important to account for the way the Holocaust was discussed within the family. Uh, this communication could have been detailed and flooding and graphic uh, about what happened to the parents, but it could also have been minimal or non-existent. And some scholars talked about the double wall of silence, the parents who were afraid to speak about what they experienced, and the children who were afraid to ask because they did, they did not want to, to cause additional distress to the parents. And also Yael Danieli talked about the conspiracy of silencing in her 84 um, paper. Uh, another important factor uh, would be the parents' mental status, especially parental post-traumatic reactions. Uh, and another hypothesis is that the transmission remains latent uh, in low stress circumstances, but manifests itself when offspring experience stress or trauma in their own lives. So when referring to parental mental status and transmission, we can see a strong relationship between parental PTSD and secondary traumatization among offspring. So this figure, presents finding from one of my studies. Uh, this sample had the one and a, 150 pairs of parents and, and uh, offsprings, the second generation. And you can see in red bars, the prevalence of PTSD symptoms. And uh, the orange bar refers to the prevalence of secondary traumatization um, in uh, Jewish offspring <coughs> from uh, uh, five groups. So you can see, at the left, those whose parents were not exposed to the Holocaust, and then those whose parents 
underwent the Holocaust, but did not suffer from PTSD. Those whose survivor father uh, or survivor mother suffered from PTSD, and those with two survivor parents <clears throat> uh, suffering from uh, PTSD. And the findings show that offspring whose survivor parents did not suffer from PTSD demonstrated the same level of PTSD and secondary traumatization as offspring whose parents were not exposed to the Holocaust. But offspring with either paternal or maternal PTSD had more symptoms. They reported having intrusive thoughts, nightmares, and other symptoms with re regard to the Holocaust. And the most vulnerable group was offspring with both survivor parents suffering from PTSD. You can see that they had the highest prevalence of PTSD, um, close to 40% um, uh, with secondary traumatization and uh, close to um, 30% uh, PTSD uh, in this group. So they were more affected by the adverse events uh, they experienced. Um, and we saw that transmission is more evident in specific families, but also transmission can manifest under specific conditions, especially when the offspring experience trauma or, uh, or uh, stress in their own lives. So this last point receives support from several uh, studies showing that children of survivors um, experience prolonged or more intensive psychological reactions following combat than other soldiers who were not second generation, who fought uh, in the first Lebanon war. That was a study by Zeava Salomon. In another example, uh, daughters of survivors were diagnosed with breast cancer, experienced stronger psychological reactions than other women who coped with cancer. That was a study by Leah Bader. And it is also possible that children of survivors are especially sensitive to stressful situations that remind them of the Holocaust. So for example, in one, one of my own studies, I found that uh, compared to other Israelis, children of survivors are more preoccupied and distressed by the threat of war and annihilation, such as the Iranian nuclear threat. They reported uh, thinking about the threat more than other people, and they also reported uh, higher distress relative to other people related to that threat. So unique reactions of survivor children are also evident in the context of the current COVID-19 pandemic. There were some media reports alluding to the possibility that uh, children of survivors associate between the COVID-19 pandemic and the war experiences of their parents. So this example is painted by Michel Kishka that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. And Michel sent this painting to his father after the father was infected by the coronavirus. And the picture presents Michel's father in a final duel face to face with the virus, which is depicted as a small green Hitler uh, the father is depicted as a fighter, but the threat of the virus is painted as the threat of total annihilation experienced during the war. Uh, unfortunately, later the father died uh, of the disease. He was 94 years old, um, and he was one of the last Holocaust survivors still living in uh, Belgium. Uh, additional reactions comes for, come from online psychoeducational supportive interactive webinars 
uh, offered by my colleague Dr. Irit Felsen to offspring of survivors, mainly in the US and Canada. And many of the comments in these meetings reflect the distinctive experience of these individuals, the second generation to the pandemic. So for example, one of the uh, a, a patient, a person said, just before the pandemic was openly recognized, I had the feeling of impending disaster, like I was living in Germany before Kristallnacht. Does, does that make sense to you? But another one said, this is not the Holocaust the pandemic. We have Zoom classes and Zoom parties. How can one compare the Holocaust to the COVID-19 pandemic? And the third person said, we are highly appreciative while comparing with what our parents went through. I have the acceptance that things can change within seconds and I have extreme resources to adapt to new situations. So you see mixed comments that are not surprising given the heterogeneity we already know exists among offspring of uh, survivors. And in one survey, my colleagues and I performed during the third wave of, of the coronavirus in Israel, uh, adult offspring who served as the main caregiver to their parents reported caregiving burden. Uh, and we found that caregiver burden was reported by a higher percentage of survivor children whose parents suffered from PTSD. So you can see that 90% of them reported high levels of caregiving burden, and 60% reported that they felt their burden worsened during the pandemic. And this percentage were much higher than in the other groups of survivor children without parental PTSD or other um, uh, offspring who served as caregivers to their parents and uh, where the parents uh, uh, did not undergo the Holocaust. So again, we see that there is specific subgroups of survivor children which require, requires our special attention because they are at high risk for experiencing mental exhaustion due to their caregiving role. So I now continue to the second part of my talk in which I would like to review direction for future research developments, mainly potential biomarkers of Holocaust effects, uh, transmission manifested in somatic systems, and the possibility of transgenerational transmission to the third generation and uh, maybe even beyond the third generation. So with regard to potential biomarkers that may transfer across generations, the focus today is on epigenetic mechanisms. So in the cell, you can see the cell nucleus at the right upper part of the figure. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes that include the DNA and related proteins. And the DNA includes thousands of genes containing the instructions for synthesizing proteins, the building blocks of our body. Epigenetic mechanisms involve, among other mechanisms, modification of DNA by methylation, the transfer of metal group, a group of chemical substances, represented here by this uh, orange uh, little uh, uh, balls that sits on specific sites of the DNA and when methylation takes place it decreases the gene's ability to express itself to synthesize proteins. So various environmental changes, for example pollution, changes to diet, stress and so forth, bring about epigenetic processes. And these epigenetic changes may be long lasting despite possible shifts in the environment, originally responsible for initiating the processes. Most of the research on epigenetic uh, 
and intergenerational processes is based on animal models where one can assess how specific manipulations affect the cross generations. So in one of the most famous studies published in Nature Neuroscience, they focused on the sensitivity to smell in mice. This sensitivity to smell is crucial for the survival of mice because it helps them identify the presence of predators or to find sources of food. And in this study, the mice in generation zero were exposed to a specific smell, which was accompanied by an electric shock. The mice learned that the smell signals danger. The smell equals danger and developed a startle response when the smell appeared again without the shock. Pups of exposed mice in generation one showed a faster development of startle response to the same smell relative to pups of unexposed mice. This is amazing. As it is possible to map the receptors which are relevant to specific smells, the researchers assessed the methylation and indeed found less methylation on the gene in charge of producing the relevant receptors for this specific smell. That is, the genes were activated more frequently and produced highly sensitive smell receptors. And this is amazing because the methylation pattern was found in DNA taken from sperm cells of generation zero and generation one. Yes, so this suggests that exposure in the first generation, generation zero, creates epigenetic change in generation zero, which was transferred to generation one through the germline. An increased startle response was further found in generation two, the third generation, the grand offspring of the originally exposed mice. So it is important to note that the findings could not have been explained by learning and imitation because the mice from generation one were not raised by the exposed mice from generation zero. It's all biological transmission. So this study is most important because it suggests that the stability to, to develop fear response to specific stimuli can be inherited through biological means. It follows that epigenetic processes is an important mechanism for which information crucial for our, for our survival can be transferred across the generations without the need to rely on the slower process of natural selection in which random DNA mutations turn out to be adaptive and then pass through the generations because of the survival of the fittest. So the epigenetic uh, mechanisms can teach so-called the next generation that he is going to cope with a specific environment. So based on these animal models, it is proposed that epigenetic modifications can be transmitted to offspring via the gametes, via the uterine environment during pregnancy, or even during early postnatal care of newborns. Uh, animal studies suggest that epigenetic signature in the gametes of stressed parents may proceed in subsequent generations. In the case of all cause survivors, parental trauma occurred years before conception of the second generation. This suggests that effects in offspring might be due in part to some biological change in the gametes. In addition, hormonal changes due to maternal stress during pregnancy can affect the uterine environment and produce epigenetic processes in the fetus. 
In animal studies, a further show that uh, red packs had epigenetic modification even when raised by surrogate, not biological, surrogate mothers who were cold and distant. So epigenetic modification can also appear through parental behaviors. So interestingly, some survival children felt the parental trauma might be imprinted within their body and use this metaphor of biological inheritance when describing the effects of the Holocaust on their lives. So this photograph presented here by the second generation artist Lilian Milgrom serves as an example. The artist projected her mother's tattoos onto her own skin. And in one of the interviews, she was quoted to say, I don't remember when I became aware of my mother's Holocaust experience. It was more like a forbidding presence, often unspoken yet very much a part of my formative psyche. Even before I could truly grasp the horrors which she endured, a sensory transference of sorts had already been transmitted through my DNA and deep into my core. In the context of trauma and PTSD, epigenetic modification can be evident, especially in genes related to endocrine signaling. So this figure shows endocrine signaling in individuals without PTSD on the left and in individuals with PTSD on the right. And you can see on the left side that during the normal response to stress, the hypothalamus in the brain sends a signal to the adrenal gland through the pituitary gland, which results in the uh, release of adrenaline from the adrenal gland. And the adrenaline increases uh, blood pressure, accelerates uh, glucose release, needs to supply the body with energy. And later the brain operates to release cortisol which is in charge of modulating the long-term bodily reaction to stress. So cortisol also down-regulates the bodily stress reactions. And you can see in the right side, in PTSD patients, PTSD is promoted by endocrine dysregulation, which includes a lower cortisol level and the premature termination of the cortisol response. So the endocrine dysregulation results in a failure to contain the nervous system response. So Rachel Yehuda and her group already published two studies in which they analyzed DNA methylation in two genes, specific sites which are related to endocrine signaling, NR3C1 and FKBP5, and in the first paper, they showed that Holocaust offspring who reported that both their parents suffered from PTSD exhibited a lowest level of methylation in NR3C1. And uh, despite the fact that none of these offspring suffered from PTSD themselves, this pattern is similar to the one found in PTSD patients. And it induces the increase in receptor uh, transcription, uh, receptors for cortisol. So this in turn creates hypersensitive receptors to cortisol, resulting in a premature termination of the cortisol response. And in the other paper, they uh, provided the first demonstration of the association between epigenetic changes in both Holocaust survivors and the second generation uh, in the methylation of FKBP5. So this is another um, site um, in charge of the cortisol glu glucocorticoid receptor complex uh, influencing uh, the bodily uh, stress response. So Yuda studies on Holocaust survivors and their offspring focus on specific genes. However, parental trauma may be related to methylation in hundreds of sites across the DNA. And in one such study, Thousands of genes were assessed among offspring of mothers who were exposed to stress 
And in this study, there were 30 something uh, offspring who, of mothers who were pregnant during the ice storm which hit Canada in 1998. These mothers, think about it, were carrying the child in their womb while the storm caused vast destruction and left millions without electricity and heating for several weeks. So think about it. A pregnant mother is sitting in her house with the baby in her belly and there is no way to warm the house. There is no electricity. The roads are uh, covered with ice so no one can come and save you or fix the electricity. And the researchers took blood samples from these offspring when they were 13 years old, 13 years after the ice storm, and examined methylation processes in thousands of genes in these uh, offspring. And you can see in the figure, methylation in 100 sites across the offspring genome, which were found to be strongly related to maternal exposure. So you can see each row represents one site on the DNA, and each column represents one subject. There were 30 something uh, subjects here. When subjects with high maternal exposure are located at the far right, and green color refers to low methylation and red refers to high methylation. And we can see that offspring with high maternal exposure at the right side of the figure show the opposite pattern of methylation relative to offspring with low maternal exposure. And high maternal exposure was related to more methylation in genes associated with the immune system and glucose metabolism and less methylation in genes producing sensitivity to stress hormone. So the effect of survival trauma and PTSD on offspring health may be explained by epigenetic modification in many genes related to endocrine signaling, somatic complaints, uh, the nervous system development, and uh, many other bodily systems. And such methylation patterns may ultimately impair offspring physical health because they result in unmodulated endocrine functioning, high blood pressure, impaired metabolism, uh, and glucose and lipids. Uh, these days, my colleagues and I collaborate with uh, Professor uh, Moshe Schiff from McGill University in Canada, and uh, we want to assess and examine uh, a whole genome methylation uh, uh, assessment on older adult uh, Holocaust uh, offspring. Indeed, parental trauma can have intergenerational effects on physical health and aging. Evidence supporting this comes from works done with non-Jewish mothers who were exposed to hunger during World War II and their children. So these studies focused on mothers who were exposed to hunger during the siege of Leningrad and during the Dutch famine. And the studies show that uh, when Russian or Dutch mothers were exposed to hunger during uh, pregnancy, the offspring suffered from various medical conditions, including obesity, hypertension, high levels of uh, blood sugar decades, decades after the, the war ended. So my colleagues and I were the first to examine physical health among middle-aged second generation. And we use data from the Israeli component of the Survey of Health, Aging and Retirement in Europe. And in this study, individuals aged 50 or older were randomly sampled across the entire country, entire Israel. And we located the, the descendants of Holocaust survivors and the comparison groups. And the groups were similar in their age, gender, composition, uh, education level, income. And we looked at various measures of physical health, number of medical conditions, disability, physical symptoms, medication use, hospitalization. And we found that relative to comparisons, offspring of survivors reported more physical uh, complaints. For example, you can see in this figure, 
offspring of survivors marked in red had a higher rate of hypertension, high blood cholesterol, more sleeping problems relative to the comparison group marked in blue. So there is good reason to speculate that late life physical morbidity might be prevented among uh, uh, offspring uh, if as therapists we also account for these possible um, ailments uh, among the patients and possibly through future modification of epigenetic uh, uh, processes uh, via uh, uh, vitamins and uh, food supplements. But this is, of course, uh, the direction for future studies. So I would like to conclude by referring to the possible effects of the Holocaust on the third generation, the grandchildren. So we saw that epigenetic studies <clears throat> on animals propose that these effects can extend across three generations. And if inheritance via the male or the maternal germline before gestation is investigated, it's important to understand that environmental stressor affect the body of the first generation, but also the germ line in red. As a result, phenotypes observed up to the second generation may result directly from the parent's experience, and effects in the third generation will be indirect. However, transmission up to the third generation can be direct if a gestation mother is exposed to environmental stressor, her fetus in green is already present and also exposed to the stressor, and the developing gametes in red inside the fetus are also exposed. <laughs> the third generation. So, for now, we still do not have data on epigenetic modification in grandchildren of survivors, but my colleagues and I are currently collecting such data through saliva samples. The third generation were born and raised many years after the Holocaust, so the distinct family past is perceived as another world from the reality in which they live. But yet, memories of the Holocaust have a salient place in their lives. Throughout the years, the memories of the Holocaust uh, became more salient for memorial days, the inclusion of Holocaust in the school curriculum. And the Holocaust occupies a central place in the lives of many grandchildren and great grandchildren. You can see here in the pictures four generations in Holocaust survivor families in Israel. So in uh, comparison to the second generation, the literature on the third generation is relatively meager. The literature on the, third, the fourth generation is extremely rare, but still we have some preliminary evidence pointing to distinctive patterns of transmission uh, to the offspring. Uh, in this study, uh, published earlier this year, we examined the uh, 160 triads of grandparents, parents, and grandchildren. And you can see in the figure that uh, like their parents, the third generation reported higher secondary traumatization, especially when the first generation reported the PTSD symptoms. So as you can see in the picture at the right, few of the, sec of the third generation even tattooed the prisoner number of their grandparents on their own arm, echoing what we have seen in the work of, um, of uh, the study I just mentioned. Perhaps this is a way to identify with what their ancestors underwent. Uh, we also know that like their parents, 
They can show lower stress tolerance, for example, during their military service or vis-a-vis -vis terror and war-related events that may raise associations of the Holocaust. However, similar to second generation, most third generation are functioning rather well and do not suffer from major uh, psychopathologies. So uh, just before wrapping up, I would like to briefly acknowledge my research colleagues who are a vital part of the long journey to study and uh, understand the, the trauma transmission. And thank you everyone for listening to me.